Well, thank you for joining us for the first nonprofit navigation series session for the month of June. We'll be doing navigation sessions each Tuesday in June as part of our 30 and 30 celebration. And we're delighted to launch the first session with a topic that actually has some relevance to celebrating anniversaries and the passage of time. We're talking today, of course, about understanding the link between capacity in the organization and your nonprofit organization's stage of development. Uh, this is something that we talk about and frankly, we thought would be particularly useful in this month because we're highlighting a variety of ways that the Midwest Center for Nonprofit Leadership works on building capacity and supporting nonprofits as they grow their own capacity with resources of a number of types. And this is one of those uh, sessions that really talks explicitly about capacity and the nonprofit organization's growth and development. Now, <clears throat> just to be specific and give credit where credit is due, the material that I'm sharing here is based on the work from Susan Kenny Stevens, who developed a book uh, after being a consultant for about 20 years. She prepared a book on this that's called Nonprofit Life Cycles, Stage-Based Wisdom for Nonprofit Capacity. Um, in the box and uh, the chat materials for this session, you will see an address uh, where you can purchase that book. We don't sell the book, but we just want you to know where the material is coming from. And we only have a few minutes to be able to share this uh, information in the session here. Of course, the book goes into substantially greater information and has some additional tools uh, that you can use uh, to understand and think about this uh, topic and issue and perhaps work with your colleagues in your organization. We have provided some resources that are important and useful. We don't talk about them here because of the short period of time, but we've used them a couple of years ago in our fall nonprofit conference. And we've posted them again today because we think that they're excellent resources that you can use with your colleagues. I mean, maybe you use it first just with yourself, but then with your colleagues to uh, talk about and reflect on the state of development of the organization, the capacity that you have to work with and where and how it would be most productive and important for your organization to grow and develop by expanding or enriching the capacity you have. So if you go to the box for this session, uh, what you'll find is the set of PowerPoint slides, this, uh, the slides that you're looking at right now. But then you'll also see the uh, diagnostic worksheets for each of the capacity elements that we'll be talking about. You'll see a life stages assessment summary worksheet, which you can use after the uh, diagnostic individual worksheets. By the way, they're not complicated worksheets. And one of the things that you'll probably notice is as you go through them, you'll say, well, we're kind of here on this one and here on this one. It's not at all unusual that you're on the cusp of stages of development as you go through, but the worksheets are ways that you can talk with your colleagues, particularly, ideally, members of your governing board, your executive leadership team, if it's feasible, the whole organization, about the stage of development of the organization and where you do and where you need to develop uh, different forms of capacity. We'll talk about those, of course, in a minute. So you have the uh, summary worksheet and an overview worksheet. And then there's another tool that I'll mention at the very end of the session that's about capacity, but it's not part of Susan's work. So we're talking about life stages. And of course, the, the fundamental point, <coughs> excuse me, is that life stages is something that we recognize for people, but organizations have life stages as well. Life stage makes a difference. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is what we expect of ourselves, of each other, of our organizations should vary by stage of life and development. And just as with people, it's crazy for us to look at an organization that's just started up, that's in its toddler stage, shall we say, and ask ourselves, why isn't it performing like a fully mature organization? That's just kind of crazy. Now, by the way, I bring it up because one of the things that's really unfortunate is that uh, we'll end up with a lot of people who give this no thought and then they judge our organization and its performance and potential based on what they think should be there rather than what is. 
we have to think about that. But the fact of the matter is we also need to help people understand, especially people who are internal consult constituents in the organization, where do we stand as an organization? I mentioned that this model comes from that of Susan Kenny Stevens. Um, <clears throat> she actually was intrigued by the concept of life stages because of two different bodies of research that she'd been interested in. She worked a lot with social workers. And so one of the, uh, one of the models, not surprisingly, that was of interest to her was Eric Erickson's life stages model about people and how we grow and develop over time. The other is organizational in nature, and it's been around for about 50 years. It was produced, uh, the research was done by a guy named Greiner, G-R-E-I-N-E-R. -E <clears throat> it's been published and republished in the Harvard Business Review at times. And Greiner's research articulates how organizations grow and develop and the stages that they go through along the way as well. Uh, by the way, his article was called Evolution and Revolution as Organizations Grow. And I'll come back and talk a little more about why that's relevant as we go through the session. So again, you know, we have to be thoughtful about what it is that we are asking. Uh, you know, this little picture reminded me of my granddaughter when she was about five years old. She's now seven. Um, you know, you can, she likes to get behind the wheel of cars and trucks and uh, she likes to pretend she's driving, but you know, nobody would look at a five-year-old child and say, well, she doesn't drive very well. That's crazy. Why isn't she driving better? It's kind of like, that's, that's nuts. That's a, an expectation that certainly nobody would entertain, or at least I believe anybody. So how well should we expect her to drive? Her capacity at that stage is certainly not analogous to the capacity of a 20-year-old uh, who's driving. And of course, some of the research would suggest that, uh, you know, through life stages of uh, our capacity, we drive better as we move on through life. But of course, at some point in time, we start to drive less well too. Life stage makes a difference. So the benefits of a, taking a life stage perspective are not to be judgmental. By the way, this is not about being a report card. It is about understanding the stage and form of development of the organization so that we can think about where and how we continue to develop the organization's capacity to improve its performance and ultimately to be sustainable as well. So this life stage model uh, that Susan has developed is a great framework for analyzing and reflecting on the organization's condition and then planning for its development. Part of uh, what I've implied in the last couple of minutes is that it's also a great uh, sort of frame of reference for being realistic, for providing realistic expectations for what we can and can't live. Some people, frankly, have uh, really liked this model because it's made them feel better about the fact that their organization is at an early stage of development and they just can't expect it to look like a mature organization. And this can give you a, a framework and language to articulate, for example, if you're talking to donors or funders or, or creditors, um, it uh, is a tool that can be especially useful in a conversation, a dialogue. By the way, one of the things that I find important, and you'll hear me talk about it a fair amount in a few minutes, is the significance of this particular model because it helps us think about how things may be out of sync. Uh, the elements of capacity that align with each stage of an organization's development don't all progress and grow at the same time and at the same rate. Sometimes they don't grow at all. We need to be thoughtful about that. So this may help us frame in, a, as the last bullet point on the slide says, without personalizing it, this just helps us be more neutral and analytical about what is the situation for our organization. And if you're using these tools as a dialogue, a basis for a dialogue and a framework, it allows you to focus on the conditions, the capacity in the organization, as opposed to the speaker, the person whose judgment it is. Um, so in that sense, you know, this is not about the executive director. It's not about who's on the board. It's about the organization itself and its growth and development. So there's some core uh, assumptions uh, that we need to work from when we're talking about this life stages work. 
first, uh, as I mentioned a minute ago, this is really much more about helping us understand our stage of development and options and opportunities for growth and development. It should not be viewed as prescriptive. I had an executive director once uh, with someone who had started a very small organization just a couple of years prior to our work. Uh, she found real relief in thinking about the organization from this stage because she kept running into people in the community who, you know, I did, fortunately they wanted a lot from her organization, but the downside was they kept looking at it saying, well, how come you don't have this? And how come you don't have that? And you're not doing well over here. And, and after she learned more about the framework, she felt like she had the basis to push back and say, this is where we are and this is how we're growing. We are paying attention to it, but please do not expect us to act like a mature organization. Now, by the way, there are pros and cons to every single stage of life in an organization. And uh, some of them are more delightful than others, of course. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but it's just, it's coming to terms with this and then using the insights to help us grow the organization because the organization develops over time. Um, organizations, by the way, are systems. And so one of the things we need to recognize is that these components or elements of capacity that we're talking about exist in alignment with each other and the organization's stage of development as a whole. And so, again, there's not a single stage that we should be at. The question is more or less, where are we in our evolution and how do we continue to grow? And by the way, this is, uh, this is material that's tied specifically to the nonprofit sector, but frankly, Susan Kenny Stevens, the developer of the model, was intrigued by two things that inspired her to work on this. One was uh, her social work colleagues and friends who talked about Eric Erickson's life stages of life. And from a human stage, that was relevant and interesting to them. But um, in the, uh, the for-profit business world, a researcher by the name of Greiner wrote an article about 40 or 45 years ago, I suppose, called Evolution and Revolution as organizations grow. Uh, what he found, and they documented there, and it's now played out in some of our uh, presentation here, is that organizations start off, and if they're effective and their leadership is strong and they're appropriately aligned with what they are at the time, they grow and develop. But at some point, that stage of development, doing things the way you've been doing them, for example, with a single startup leader, charismatic, a founder, whatever, as wonderful as that was, at some point, that alignment between the characteristics of that form of leadership, governance management, and the stage of the organization don't continue to work. So the sad irony is everything that got you to your certain level of development won't get you to the next level of development until you change the mode and nature of your operations in the same way that you know something that will help a toddler grow from ages two to three to four is certainly not going to help uh, someone grow from ages 10 to 11 to 12. So every stage has seeds of its conditions, both successes and challenges in this previous stage that it's been in. Now, again, we're using this model, uh, give credit where credit is due. This is Susan Kenny Stevens model, although there are other life stages models out there. There's one that was developed uh, by a group called Fieldstone in the Twin Cities, Judy Shark and Simon created hers. I happen to find this one somewhat more useful, but you know, the point is thinking about life stage. So the, um, you know, the seven basic life stages that organizations go through, as you can see highlighted here, are, um, and again, you know, this is not intended to be prescriptive. This is intended to just offer a bit of description about the stage of the organization. That's why we wanna talk about it. I mean, obviously every organization has to start at an idea stage. This is a couple of folks, or maybe even just one of us sitting together in a kitchen, at the kitchen table or at a table in a bar, or <laughs> I guess if you're Cerner, it was a picnic table in Loose Park from what I hear. Um, you know, a couple of people just talking to each other and, and sometimes it's one, sometimes it's more. Sometimes by the way, and I should say this, there's no guarantee you'll progress through the life stages. You know, there are plenty of ideas, uh, maybe you've had some yourself, I know I have, where it's a great idea, but then it falls off, it just kind of stops. 
there are some ideas that'll make it slightly up the curve. You know, you'll get into the startup stage, but lack of energy, lack of support, whatever it is, you know, you may end up dropping off instead. You're not guaranteed to progress your way through this curve, but organizations that grow and develop have been doing that. And that's what we are seeing in sort of the logical growth and development. So you progress from the startup to the, um, to the growth stage, if you're able to make that work. Ultimately, you know, Susan's model, and I think this is overly prescriptive, is that your stage of maximal vitality is as you've gone through this growth stage and you're starting to hit your stride as mat at maturity. Well, that's true to an extent, but the reality is I think a lot of people would say some of the most vital things done in organizations are happening even as we're moving up through this very exciting growth stage. But as we'll talk about, there are challenges there. One of the things that's really critical, and it's not really a lot of fun to acknowledge though, is at some point we move from growth into maturity and over time, you know, maturity actually starts to decline because the conditions that we were created to address and develop change. And so we have to adapt and change as well, which is the essence of this point. Ideally, you don't go so far into decline. Susan drew it out this way, which is as you're into the decline, Ideally, you're going to make that loop back and hit, you know, a revitalization cycle that you would call your growth stage. Um, that's part of the reason to continue to have conversations about, well, where are we? How are we growing? How is this working? And is it working well? By the way, if you're in an organization with very large programs, um, this same life stage process occurs in large programs as well. Uh, but programs live inside organizations. So one of the things that's sort of an intriguing balance is what's the life stage of the program as compared to the life stage of the organization? I will tell you candidly, you know, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's not. You know, we're celebrating our 30th anniversary of the Midwest Center for Nonprofit Leadership. We are a unit of the University of Missouri, Kansas City, which is you know 100 years roughly a hundred years older than the Midwest Center. So one of the challenges we had is we were working with startup activities of the Midwest Center was we're in an organization that is up here living and it's a public sector bureaucracy as well. So it's very much this mature organization, but here we are over here trying to make it work. And there were days when that uh, change in alignment really kind of drove us nuts. That in some ways it still does. Now, to go back to that notion of depersonalization, if you don't know that some of these things are sort of the natural order of evolution and growth, you may start to say, well, those people are getting in my way because they're picking on us. Well, maybe they are. One of my family members used to say to me, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't out to get you. But the reality is, you know, a lot of these things are conditions of logical conditions. And what we need to think about is that this is just what we have to work with. So let's move ahead. Now, I've been telling you about life stage, but the thing we want to connect here in today's brief session is the linkage between life stage and capacity. Stevens, Susan Kenny Stevens describes uh, those life stages as stages of capacity. Now, capacity, you know, what the heck is capacity? We talk about it all the time at the Midwest Center. We exist to provide support for capacity building for nonprofits and sometimes for government agencies. But capacity is potential. It's like the resources, or as the, the slide says, I wrote this when some funders asked me a few years ago, what is capacity? Well, it's potential. It's the assets that you can, you can mobilize to accomplish mission, vision, and goals. But one of the things we have to remember is capacity isn't impact and it's not outcome. Capacity, is the set of resources, the fuel, so to speak, but also, by the way, if you use a you know, motor vehicle, an engine as a metaphor, you know, you've got fuel, but you've got to have oil in the crankcase. You've got to have the right equipment there. So you've got capacity mobilized, effective, organized and mobilized effectively. Capacity leads to performance. And over time, performance achieves organizational effectiveness and impact in behalf of the community. So capacity is essential, but having the best capacity doesn't mean your impact is strong. That's where we need, frankly, this mix of capacities 
Because what Kenny, Susan Kenny Stevens says is there are five elements of capacity that we need all to be in relative alignment with the stage of the organization. The one that she talks about that, you know, I think most of us would say, oh, that's the reason we exist. That's our organization's mission or our program's mission is, is tied specifically to the delivery of, of services and programs. So it is program activity. Now, I'm gonna zap ahead to an image that Susan drew, but I thought it was actually a very apt image to look at. Susan included this in her book on life stages, stage-based capacity development. Um, you know, uh, she described, sorry for messing up the slide, but uh, she described the, um, the purpose of the organization. Of course, the mission is the bouquet and the vase on the table, the vase on the table, but it's the programs that deliver on that. But then there are four elements of capacity. Some groups will break it into more finely tuned elements, but at core, I like this as a basic place to start. There are four core elements of capacity that every organization needs to have, and it needs to be in relative alignment with the stage of development of the organization. So she drew this out as the four legs on the table, the four legs holding up the programs and their impact and performance ultimately to achieve mission. So to go back to the previous slide, we've got program capacity, which is very much about why we're doing what we're doing and the value that's there. But the um, other four elements of capacity empower and enable that and presented not in any particular order, just happened to be the order she listed them. Um, one is, is management, and I would put leadership, organizational leadership and management at the executive level, but it's more operational, by the way, for those of you who've seen some of the workshops we've done on leadership versus management. Management is more organizing, operating, keeping the system in balance, troubleshooting when problems arise, things like that. So we need management capacity. Similarly, we need governance capacity. Susan's model talks about it very much about it from the perspective of board and the board as governance. If you've been to some of my other workshops, you know that I prefer to understand governance as a function because it is the leadership. It's where and how do we fit in the world? How do we make our organization uh, capable of and ultimately performing in a way that delivers on the impact to the community? So governance is that strategic level of setting mission, vision, and goals. Management is how do we organize to actually uh, deliver on the goals and strategic direction that we've set out. But uh, governance is definitely about boards. Uh, it often is also about, um, about the top executive leadership of the organization. In fact, I have asserted that uh, some of you may be familiar with that. We love to lament the disease uh, founder syndrome, mm. which someone informed me recently was probably descriptive of me because I've been with the Midwest Center for essentially all, not all of its 30 years of service, but 27 of those years. Uh, and one of the problems is founders are a good match at one stage of development, but then the question is, what do you need next stage to uh, help the organization move ahead? But at the startup stage, the founder is the governance because that whole question of mission and why are we here? Well, it starts with the founder or founders' uh, brains and what they were thinking of, and then it grows ideally to develop. Uh, to get ahead of myself, but just to make the note, uh, in a sense, um, one of the one of the areas I often see in organizations going through high growth is that their governance is still sort of stuck back at the early startup stage of the organization. It's not keeping pace, which is why, and this is the essence of each of these areas of capacity, we may need to grow governance capacity at certain times. We may need to grow other kinds of capacity. Now, the fourth of the elements that's here is the financial resource capacity, and this is, um, you know, depend, like all these, it's dependent specifically on the organization, but having adequate resources of the right types that are available to be drawn upon and mobilized at the time that you need to is what this is about. Uh, now, for a lot of organizations that are philanthropic in their business model, is philanthropy, uh, you know, it's fundraising, but it's not always. As many of you know, uh, a significant share of the nonprofit sector actually operates more on earned income uh, generating revenue through the delivery of services and charging fees and things. That's as much financial resource as is uh, fundraising. It's just a different business model. 
And last but not least is the administrative systems capacity. Um, and that's where, you know, the accounting system, the reporting system, the tracking system, um, payroll systems, all those kinds of things uh, are in the administrative systems capacity category. Um, not surprisingly, you know, administrative systems often lag a bit in development behind some of the others because they're never why we, at least from so far in my career, I've never met anyone who said they founded a nonprofit with the hope that they would get to create a payroll system or boy, I hope we get to go buy insurance, um, you know, risk management system. So now the, uh, <clears throat> the way to, uh, map this together and you'll see some, the worksheets have this little header, at this graphic at the top, because the interesting thing to think about is, all right, what is uh, our organization's general stage, which is what this particular line here is focusing on. What do we think our overall organizational life stage is? But frankly, I find it most useful in discussions in organizations to start off looking at the uh, at the element capacity elements and then go back and say, how does that match with our general life stage? By the way, I should say um, that um, there's only moderate correlation between organizational age and life stage. There's some organization, I recently frankly worked with an organization that's been around for about 45 years and they're still in the startup early growth stage. They've just not moved forward as an organization beyond that. Uh, you can say that's good or bad, but just it, it is as it is. So don't assume that age uh, is definitive when it comes to life stage. Uh, it's unlikely an organization that's only two or three years old is going to be here in, in the maturity stage because it takes time to develop and grow those aspects of performance and capacity. That said, um, you know, you're not guaranteed to move through it. And as, as that graphic illustrates, we mentioned it earlier on, the, uh, you know, the reality is organizations go through the curve and ultimately hit a point where they need to revitalize. And so you may be so old that you've been through a phase of decline and revitalization and brought yourself back to a new cycle of growth and development. That would be the ideal. <clears throat> For that reason, Susan identified as one of the, one of the stages in the model, this turnaround stage that uh, follows some level of decline. So as we talked about earlier, we've got programs as uh, maybe the most sort of central to mission accomplishment, but then to have uh, programs deliver, perform, grow, and meet the needs of our community requires that we have effective management, we have effective governance, we have financial resources, and our administrative systems align. And that word alignment is part of what's significant. If the organization is a whole, is, is about here in the curve. In other words, if you were gonna map it on this, these little bars here, <clears throat> the organization is, uh, is here in terms of high growth. Often you'll find that the programs then are, are there <clears throat> or fairly close to it because so often our programs uh, align quite accurately with the overall organizational stage. When they don't, it's because you'll have some programs maybe that are more or less advanced but the organization as a whole is somewhere in the middle here. But then the question is, okay, how well does our management system match? Have we created you know, the, the, the position descriptions, the job descriptions, the organization by departments, the uh, reporting systems, performance leadership and appraisal, all those things. Are they, um, you know, are they in alignment with this? Or maybe we've said, nah, we don't have time for that. If you're in a new organization that's got high growth, you may have not spent much time on management. So your management may be over here much more in the characteristics of the startup stage. I was describing earlier that notion of governance. A lot of times a founder board will come together and get things going and help the organization progress. But if you don't continue to refine and redesign and develop for the next generation of service, your board and your board executive relationship you may be stuck over here a little bit as well. Um, as, as we talked about earlier, you know, financial resources, so you map those and administrative systems are also developed. Now I've, I've had people say to me, wow, you know, it's, I mean, it'd be great if we had financial resources that were way over here. We're a, we're a high growth organization. 
but our uh, resources, you know, we've got the, the nature and flow and structure of our resource development, say fundraising or whatever, that we're over here in maturity. So, you know, that's great. I'm going to share something that sometimes people consider a bit counterintuitive, which is organizations that have a fair degree of misalignment or poor alignment among these five elements of capacity find that it's quite uncomfortable. And I've had people say to me, well, you know, I'll take that initial $10 million startup gift and then we'll start and grow staff and all that kind of thing. You know what? I mean, you know, you can do it. And, and uh, in fact, we've got some interesting examples in the region. That said, um, if your finances, financial systems are at the stage of maturity, but all of your other operations are back in startup or early growth, you're gonna feel a real discontinuity. It feels out of sync. And I will say, honestly, I have seen a couple of organizations that foundations thought, oh, we should have this, we'll make a huge gift and it will, you know, then they won't have to worry about the financial resources. Well, you know what, you can choke on too much. And they did in one case in particular, I'm not gonna say it by name, of course, but that organization is dead. It couldn't cope with, and it, it got way out of whack because the financial resources were so out of sync with particularly their management and governance practices. It helped them get the programs to a, a more uh, mature stage of development faster, but they had other problems about that. And, you know, in an era of, a, of big data and all the stuff that you're hearing, I probably don't have to say a lot about administrative systems. You know, you, this is where you get your data. This is how you organize and monitor how you're performing. But this is the point, you know, let's understand where we are and, uh, I guess one of the things I've seen in a lot of organizations, particularly in health and quasi healthcare organizational settings, is that you'll have an organization that may have programs in maturity, but their data systems for reporting on their impact, and ultimately that often drives their billings, their systems for key performance indicators may be back here somewhere. And so they're actually uh, not balancing it out in a way that works. Now I've messed up this graphic, but we, we invite people to think about, well, where are you in terms of capacity overall life stage and how much alignment is there um, in the uh, systems that are there? From a capacity building perspective, you know, nothing's ever gonna be completely in alignment with anything else, but this is a way to sort of host a discussion about where and how we should continue to grow and develop as we, uh, continue to develop the organization? How do we grow the capacity that's most useful? Um, and so it may well be, for example, that you've got, you know, you're generally over here in terms of organizational life stage. Um, you know, your board may still be somewhat unorganized or organized like a founding board would be. So you want to work on board development, but you don't stop everything else while you're doing that. The question to consider strategically is what are the aspects of capacity that will best help us continue to grow and develop and to the extent that they're a barrier to our growth and development, what do we need to do to address those? So the um, I'm gonna just talk through, let me back up for a minute. Uh, I'm gonna focus primarily on these middle stages because that's where most organizations are, but I just wanna give you a highlight. Again, Susan Kenny Stevens' book on life stages uh, is, uh, is a great resource. It has uh, much more information, although, by the way, it's not a really thick book. It is, uh, you know, probably about 120 pages, something like that. So when we look at the stage, you know, we start off at the, um, at the stage that's the idea stage, you know, where you just, you know, you've got a founder or some group of founders they're motivated to do something. The vision is compelling and so they're excited. They wanna go ahead and do this. Those of you who are founders may well relate to one of the observations. These points, by the way, are, I, I've rephrased them slightly, but these are from Susan's research in her book. Uh, one of the things that's best, I actually think this is a little bit like raising kids too. Founders generally don't know how hard it is going to be when they start an organization. It's kind of like, I'm so, I believe in this so much uh, and to go back again to see where those capacity stages come in, you know, 
the, the management, the governance, the financial resources, at the, at the idea stage, you have very little of that. And so what you're really working with a lot is what you might call sweat equity and in-kind resources. Founders are often just drawing down on, uh, and well, maybe literally on their credit cards, but uh, on friends and family and volunteers. The stage where it starts to look like a real organization is that startup stage where you've got more excitement. You're still heavily dependent on the founder, but you're trying to logically grow your capacity uh, to bring some others in to help with, with both governance and management kinds of roles. But this is still, you know, a startup organization is a few folks who are getting together, maybe employees, maybe volunteers or a mix. And they really believe in what they're doing. And at its best, this is when people start to see, oh, there's some promise there. But one of the problems with, excuse me, the startup stage is that it's, it's a labor of love and your systems aren't supporting you. So it's a, it's a lot of work. By the way, I have a son who's an entrepreneur. And I have to say, I'm reminded constantly of this in the for-profit space as well. You know, it's a lot of work. The next stage then is we're actually, you know, going from startup to growth. And um, if I were to gr draw the diagram a little bit more accurately, growth usually has a trajectory that takes it up higher than that, faster. And that's part of the excitement and or threat that exists there. Because if you're hitting the growth stage, it means that constituents in the community have started to say, yeah, this, this is good. This is what we need. We can value this. Um, so one of the things that happens is that growth happens fast and you don't necessarily plan for it and maybe you haven't even intended or, or gotten ready to grow it. This is where staffing, for example, may be way out of sync with the demand for your services. So that means the de demand exceeds your capability to deliver. Um, people love it though, and uh, this is where we're really developing. But one of the things that uh, is, is a reality is that we're generally undercapitalized on, you know, talk about financial resource systems. And as a result of those systems being underdeveloped, we're, if you're there and you're the founder or a key actor in this organization, you often feel you're burning the candle at both ends. So then as we grow, through growth, and by the way, I'm talking about these as though, you know, from an, from an organizational life stage overall, um, because as we've talked about, you know, just a minute ago, high growth may mean that your administrative and financial systems are way back down here, your management maybe, maybe management's a little better, but you have to think about that. As we move to maturity, the organization is stable in ways that there's a little bit of relief to it. You've got staff that has more experience, uh, if the whole organization is relatively well aligned with maturity, it means that you're operating, you've kind of hit your stride, you have a steady system with all the components working, you know, bringing clients in, serving the clients, documenting your performance, generating resources as a result of that successful performance that then fuels additional next generation work. That's all much more in place. Um, so you have a good reputation, you know, if everything's solid, you've got a good reputation, you're recognized as viable and valuable. And uh, by the way, along the way, you've moved away from, <clears throat> excuse me, away from just relying as you did in the early growth stage on whoever was with us, we've just got to work together and make this work. When you hit the mature stage, this is where you're actually, you've got more of a position description and you're, you know, if somebody quits, you know what you need in the way of performance and skills and abilities, knowledge uh, to play that role. And so, uh, you know, this is where a more standard human resource management func function would be a part of it. HR is part of the administrative systems. Now, inevitably, and this is not a sign of failure. The failure is when you don't recognize it or don't choose to address it. We do move toward decline because in a world where conditions change, we're going to be less in sync with the needs, the evolving needs of the community than we were at the beginning. Nonprofits are often in great alignment with the community if they survive at all because they were meeting a community need. But if you keep doing what you always did and the community's need has gone off in another direction, 
Uh, this is where you hit what we would call a decline stage. You're still operating based on the internal operations you have had for the last cycle and stage of development. Um, you're not listening to your clients as much as you're just involving staff. And uh, frankly, uh, you know, the board may be overly comfortable because it's kind of like, oh, thank heavens, this thing's running like a smooth machine. Uh, well, it may be, but is it, if you're not serving the community, it may not be what you really need. So the question at this stage is, okay, if we're progressing in this direction, when do we start planning for regeneration, for renewal? Um, and ideally, even as you're just starting to recognize decline, you'll hit that turnaround cycle there. Um, if not, maybe you wait too long. So, you know, the turnaround cycle is, it can be a very exciting uh, stage and some people actually love turnarounds more than they like startups. Uh, it just kind of depends on how you're wired, I guess. But this calls for you to rework your systems and to think at a very thoughtful, careful way, which elements of our systems are performing well and we just keep you know, leveraging and capitalizing on them and where is that capacity no longer meeting the needs uh, that the organization has of us and, uh, and ultimately of the community has of us in our performance. Turnarounds are hard because it, you know, to go back to, if you think about maturity, it felt, it felt fine and decline is not something that's not like, oh, well, that's not going well, but you know, it's still basically okay. Well, when do you figure out? It's usually because you've got some major cataclysm that's knocked you off, uh, off your even balance uh, along the way. And that's the, I, now if you don't go to turnaround, of course, what happens is you end up in the terminal stage instead. So the, you know, I'm not gonna focus on this overall, but uh, you know, the, the issue with terminal stage is that the organization is really not all there. Sometimes it's not there much at all. You may have some programs, some legacy programs, but they may not be dependable. They may not be valued in the community. Uh, unfortunately, this is a kind of a depressing time and it's why you really wanna revitalize earlier because Folks have lost the drive and energy, the passion for the mission. And it's just kind of like, we're just trying to survive. And so you end up with uh, some organizational depression. One of the things financially that happens is if you made a lot of money in growth and maturity, you may actually be living off earnings and reserves that you've stored away. But the old cliche from my Minnesota community roots, you know, you're eating your seed corn because you ought to be using that money to, uh, to grow and revitalize your programs. And instead you just end up using the money to keep paying for what it is you've always been doing. So the question for us in, in terms of our work is where are we as an organization and where are the individual elements that are in our organization? Um, you know, where are we in some distinct alignment and where maybe uh, are we a bit out of alignment? And those would be the areas where we want to think most about growing capacity. I will say that um, it's, it's good to constantly think about growing capacity. Our experience is that a lot of organizations think about capacity in certain areas and they're kind of blind to it in other areas. So a resource or a tool of the sort that we're sharing with you today helps you think about the question of, um, you know, are we looking at the whole organization and the array of uh, program or of, uh, capacity that we need to have? And are we thinking about all of what's there and not there as opposed to uh, just the things that are either most popular or more obvious? So, we have posted some self-assessment worksheets uh, in the time that we have in these short navigation sessions, we don't have time to work through it, but um, the uh, worksheets are posted in box. Uh, there, are, there are three worksheets that are there. I'll tell you about them in a minute. The reason to use them and frankly to use them as discussion guides is because we wanna be thinking as a leadership team, maybe as the whole organization, what are the agency's greatest capacity challenges and barriers that interfere with us continuing or growing in our impact 
on behalf of the community. And of course, you know, some things, you know, you may need to work on in their media. It's kind of like, well, the place is on fire. I guess we better put that fire out. The thing to think about that isn't always as clear are what are those long-term capacity changes, things that maybe don't present themselves as crises right now, but in fact, they are inhibitors. They are keeping you from continuing to serve at the level and in the ways that the community most cares about. So in the, uh, in the uh, box for this session, you find the uh, Life Stages Diagnostic Worksheet. There's actually a set of five. And what they present are little benchmark phrases. And then, you know, you look at them and say, well, we're kind of here and here. By the way, it's not at all unusual to be on the cusp of one stage to the next. There's, there's no guarantee you're going to be right in the middle of growth or right in the middle of maturity or anything else. Um, and so, you know, just acknowledge that, you know, we're kind of on the edge. Those little worksheets use descriptors of conditions in the organization to help you think about, well, we're probably more or less here or there. So the diagnostic worksheets are there um, looking to invite you to look at, and I would ideally suggest you use these to talk with your management team, your board, both. Um, uh, we actually sometimes have converted these things to Qualtrics worksheets uh, so people can do them on a survey ahead of time. And then we get together and talk about where were we in relative agreement and where were we sort of all over the map. We, you know, members of the board, members of the executive team. After you've done those individual worksheets, then you can use two little summary worksheets to help you think about next steps. One of those worksheets it's called the Life Stages Assessment Summary Worksheet, and it invites you to reflect on, for each of the elements of capacity, what's, what's there and where maybe is, uh, is our capacity keeping us from serving as well as we could. And uh, another you know, worksheet, which seems like it overlaps, but it's additional questions are, the next step is, okay, after you've thought about where are we in aggregate, uh, what are the barriers to our continued growth, development, and service to the community? Now, just to make a connection to an earlier life or an earlier navigation session, uh, in January, I had shared a, a sort of an overview of organizational assessment tools. As part of that, uh, I did include a, um, a tool on capacity specifically recently developed by some uh, researchers at Northwestern University, Michelle Shumate and her colleagues, and that focuses a little bit more on nonprofit capacity. They actually have eight categories of capacity. The kinds of things that you saw in Susan's model, but a couple of other things, uh, for example, one of them is particularly significant, is they suggest that the ability to adapt and grow and change is by itself an element of capacity, apart from management talent, board talent, things of that sort. So the, um, you know, the question is, is to go to the next stage and say, well, where and how do we use these things to think about it? So let's take, you know, 10 minutes or so, take your reactions, your comments. Uh, if you've got experience with this or another life stage tool, maybe you could tell us uh, in what ways it was helpful. And maybe if it wasn't, you know, what did you learn from that? Dave, um, there's been some discussion kind of earlier in the morning about how this is what we do with this and how to, who should be involved in it and things like that. I think probably you've sort of covered that in the last couple slides, but if you could just kind of be explicit, like how would this look? You, know, you said leadership team, but who should be available, you know, in, involved in this? And also how any just tips you can give to maybe the ED taking this back to their board and telling them to do this, um, you know, any guidance there? Yeah, yeah, thanks. It, um, I will say candidly, uh, the driver to get into this topic often is because the executive director or a key executive will have some intuition that it would be a good idea. And it might be because there are new things that we could grow and develop, or it might be that there's this intuition that some things maybe ought to sink a little bit uh, one way or another. So it's often launched by the executive director and or the board chair um, that um, 
I mean, candidly, if the executive director is not effective in the role as an executive, that's a management capacity issue. And of course, there are times when boards see that and say, wow, we need to worry about this. So <clears throat> it, it may start with one person or a couple of people just saying, wow, we should think about this. Uh, I have worked with some organizations where the management team did this first just to try it out and just to host. And I, I really like this idea of using these kinds of tools. I said this in January about the other assessments too. Use these tools as fuel and, and a structure for dialogue. Uh, don't assume that it's telling you something that's good or bad. And by the way, I really want to underscore, these are not report cards. It is not appropriate to use a capacity assessment as a report card. It's, this is more like your health checkup kind of a thing. And then the question, what do we do about that? So um, ideally, you'd use this as a way to get your management and board. And if your organization is a a size that you can do it, maybe even the whole organization together. The advantage to using a tool like this is that it encourages people to start thinking about capacity and how it connects to performance and impact. By the way, <clears throat> there are a lot of organizations that actually perform phenomenally well with quite limited capacity. One of my colleagues likes to refer to that as punching above your weight. Um, the the thing is, that should be a worry. If you are constantly drawing on and stretching to the edge your capacity because um, it's all you can do to keep serving and delivering, you're on the mode to burnout. And candidly, I would uh, suggest that that's what we've seen with a huge share of nonprofits in the last 15 months, organizations that have been pushed um, you know, they've lost capacity in certain areas um, or alternatively, they had capacity for a stable environment, but they were now challenged to have more response capacity in a pandemic and or recession environment. And so the trick was to go back and say, well, what has this done to us? I would suggest, by the way, that part of the reason this topic is relevant now as we are we think, hope, you know, knock on wood, trying to move beyond the pandemic stage. Um, we need to think about what do we have to work with as we're moving forward to the next level. Um, so using it as a discussion tool is useful. As I mentioned, um, uh, we have actually taken the, the structure uh, that's in this Susan Kenny Stevens tool, although actually I did it with the museum a couple of weeks ago uh, with, with the life stage tool they were using too. Uh, we just asked people to go online and rate. That was, they used um, members of their board and, and um, their, some key executives and some key community constituents who really knew the organization well. You have to think about the constituents because this is very much an inside game. So it may be that it's, you know, don't ask people questions if they don't have the capacity to answer. They don't have the frame of reference to answer because that will just irritate them and it'll give you crummy data. That's my general rule about survey research. Don't ask people questions to which they don't know the answer. You irritate them and you get crappy data. But um, if you've got people who are in a position especially the board. I mean, you know, they may not all have the same data, but this is a way to bring them together and help people get more on the same page. And then from there say, so which of these are actually having the greatest impact on our capacity to grow and, and develop and continue to serve? Uh, if, you, if, if the group's not ready, if they aren't ready for that conversation, maybe you start with a small, you know, a, a committee of a board and or of your executive team. Uh, I would go where the interest exists first and then grow from there. Do we have some other questions, Cindy? I saw something pop up, but then on my chat, it disappears fairly quickly. So I didn't have a chance to read it. Mark just posted his usual things. Um, I don't have any other questions. The other, um, just comments, people are enjoying the, the resources very much. Um, there was um, an, an agreement that the, um, about 
the uh, it's kind of the paranoia that can come in when you have a startup that comes out of a, a, a mature organization and how that can work a little bit. Yeah, that's that's a great observation. And, and frankly, uh, you know, there are a couple of variations on that that are really smart to think about. Um, I've had, uh, I saw Mark post in my office hours thing. In the last month and a half, I've had probably three or four organizations talk to me about how to connect with another agency as its fiscal sponsor. Um, and that's not a bad idea in a lot of cases because what it is is you're borrowing the capacity of the fiscal sponsor to, particularly around financial management and accountability, um, you're, you're capitalizing on their capacity. The challenge is when their systems are so much more sophisticated than your little startup is, it may be that they're entirely set up to address all of those uh, elaborate requirements of either foundations or especially governmental entities, things like that. And when um, you are piggybacking on a highly mature system, you'll be forced to take care of it and feed it information that may feel and may actually be quite irrelevant to your stage of development. Now, you know, that's, that's the balancing act and you have to think about exactly where and how it makes the most sense. Uh, you know, honestly, the motivation to look at fiscal sponsorship is often driven by a capacity need, which is I can't, you know, I don't have the financial staff. I, I, you know, in a lot of cases, you may not even have your 501c3 status. And so you need an entity. The reason you don't have your 501c3 status is because you don't have enough capacity built up to make that connection. Uh, I did see there was one question that popped up and um, go back to it. Um, uh, Rachel had, had asked, are there resources that go into more detail on each of these capacity areas? Uh, I would recommend that you get Susan's book. It's a fairly inexpensive book. She self-published it. It's, it's, it's called Life Stage. Uh, uh, I just put it up there today for them, the Amazon link. Excellent. Yeah, uh, it's, I mean, by the way, Susan, uh, this has gathered such interest uh, among both the consulting and the practice community that about five or six years ago, Susan Kenny Stevens, who was looking for a chance to move to a warmer climate, moved out of Minneapolis, St. Paul area and moved to New Mexico where she started the Life Stages Institute. And uh, it's actually, she's now retired from the founding executive role and they've brought another person in to manage it. She's still there. Uh, they have a number of resources on their website. Um, the book itself is really user-friendly. Uh, I mean, I find it user-friendly, but the better test is people have said to me, executives and board leaders have said to me, I found that a very instructive book. I will say I involved a, a local community executive director in my graduate class a couple of years ago. I use this model uh, to inform uh, strategic thinking and planning, among other things. And uh, this particular woman <laughs> popped, she joined me. I often have an executive uh, who will partner with me in a class and just share, you know, they get rebuttal time. They get to tell the students what's really going on after I talk about what the theories and the models say. So uh, I brought her in. Um, she wanted to partner with me on this. I presented the life stages stuff and uh, in the classroom, and she stood up and said, why have you not told me about this before? I needed <laughs> to know this five years ago. You cheated me. <laughs> and I said, well, thanks for making me look bad in front of the class. But apart from that, you know, it was just kind of like her response was, we were going through stages, and I didn't understand the nature of that. Thank you for telling me, but by the way, you should have told me sooner which has motivated me to put this together. And we, frankly, after she said that, it led us to make this a part of one of our conferences a few years ago as well. So to go back, I've made too long an answer. The answer to the question, where are more resources on this, is in the Stevens book, there is a, a, a section that's all about what do you do if you're at this stage? What do you do if you're at this stage? or even more importantly, what do you do if you're here and here and it feels way out of whack? 